if, if I can touch on that, essentially the sum of what our work is doing, my, my team and I, are essentially trying to build personalized AI teaching systems that are able to map the sum of human knowledge as it's being released online and to essentially optimize personalized lesson plans uh, for each given individual's mood as it changes in real time, uh, the unique learning styles. Uh, we envision the future of education looks something like kids playing a video game. Uh, the video games will react to their moods uh, to optimize their engagement. They're not going to want to eat, use the bathroom, do anything else but just play these games. But they're going to be learning mathematics, physics, calculus. Uh, we, spend, we see the number of hours kids are already spending on video games and say that the past couple hundred years of pedagogical sciences is not really a science, more of an art. Teachers come out with hypotheses and then putting it into the classroom with really small data feedback with non-replicable experiments. So what we're trying to do is essentially build uh, data that correlates human behavior uh, using biometrics mm -hmm. with how do we interact with media, how do we interact with each other, how do we build a uh, large enough critical mass of data that lets us begin to use unsupervised analysis to model what are the meta variables that govern human engagement, human learning? Uh, how do emotion, stress, anxiety, your personality types, uh, your political bias, uh, all the different things that quantify quantifies a human? Uh, what is your heart rate? Uh, all the different biometric and personality, uh, inner, external nature, uh, and how do these correlate with uh, actions, behavior in response to an extremely diverse set of uh, attention economy assets like film, media, online courses. Uh, so the idea is by understanding um, how do people react in general, then we can begin to uh, optimize uh, performance. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still on site in the beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. We are now going to be talking about AI to optimize human performance and much more. We have Ben Tam joining us on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. It's really wonderful to talk about the work my team is doing. Thanks so much for coming on the program, Ben. And I'm really grateful to Andreas Forsland for introducing us. Oh yeah, Andreas and his company, Cognition, is doing some really cutting edge works. Yes, I'm so nice pumped. Nice to have mutual acquaintances. Exactly, lots of them, <laughs> L lots of them. We have so many mutual friends. Yeah, it seems like. I'm pumped to dive, I'm so pumped to dive in with you. Ben's background, for those who don't know, is founder of Atlas Holdings, which is an AI company working on emotion technologies using human data to optimize human performance. You can find all the links in the bio below, atlasholdings.fund, uh, neurotechx.com, as well as his LinkedIn profile. Ben, let's start things off with a big picture understanding of you know, who we are, what's really going on in this reality, where we're heading. So it seems like humans are immersed in this exponential technology age. It seems like AI is eating our world. And it seems like the most upstream issue that we can try and get to is the education of children. Is trying to make it so that children, when they're born into the world, have deep feelings of interconnectedness with other humans and with nature that they understand the nature of this reality, that they can figure out what their North Star is and pursue that, bringing their gifts into the world. Tell us about how you see that equation and how what you're building is helping catalyze that process. No, that's a really excellent way to, to begin the conversation because we do live in a time, as, as um, many as of us in the uh, tech and general entrepreneurial industry know, is, it's really catalytic time where we have really two paths that humanity can go down. One is a bright, beautiful future where everyone is empowered, uh, or another is a really nuclear fireball. And depending on what the actions of our leaders do today, 
it's really going to catalyze one of these visions or another. So if we think about things on a first principle basis, what do humans need to thrive and be happy? And um, first and foremost, we need to survive. Uh, we need to be able to uh, overcome the hardships that nature throws at us, the, the wind, the rain, get shelter, get food. Um, and we do live in a society today where much of these uh, uh, resources are provided through a particular system and structure. But what we're heading into in the world is we're going to see increasing levels of inequality. We're going to see higher levels of job optimization through AI. There's just going to be a bigger social tension, a social unease. And what is the best way to ensure a more stable, uh, prosperous human race uh, and an interplanetary uh, species? Uh, I believe rather than using AI to centralize and um, automate more work, with, that's naturally the way things progress. But what if we use AI and all these revolutionary technologies to empower the, not just the weakest uh, links in society to strengthen the whole chain, so to speak, but how do we use technology to essentially uh, structurally change the system? Uh, the idea is that in a world where um, with sufficient education, we're able to master the forces of nature, uh, find a way to get shelter, food, uh, if everyone has the means to uh, innovate, to think about uh, what they need to survive, through whether it's through um, external help, but ultimately education is what, what allows us to independently uh, not just think about our passions, but get the skills, the tools, and resources to execute on them. So hopefully a future humanity, if a lot of our leaders today do our best to like catalyze change in the right direction, is one where people feel empowered enough to first and foremost survive, <laughs> and then uh, more importantly after that to think about what they really care about in this world, and then build it. <laughs> uh, but you can't do any of that without a sufficient uh, knowledge base uh, internally, whether it's engineering, mathematics. Uh, so if you want to be the best chef or a great chef, you have to know the fundamentals, first principles behind uh, culinary. Uh, so, uh, or even being a gardener, I want to be the best, most beautiful gardener or uh, artist in the world. It requires a base level of um, education, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of the work that my team is doing is geared towards uh, trying to solve that education problem structurally. Uh, once and for all, so to speak, uh, with uh, by automating pedagogy. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Okay, so it's as though then, um, let's go with the directional arrow of civilizational trajectory towards uh, prosperity for all. Let's follow that one because <laughs> that's that's my favorite way of putting it is a way, don't sell, I'm not selling any S stories around fear um, only towards prosperity, only towards the enlightened civilization for all. So, okay, so now in order to get there, we need a, a very aware way of meeting the basic needs of all people on the planet. And the these basic nutrients that are needed, you were listing some love from the people that b birthed us into the world. We need love, we need air, water, food, shelter, electricity, education, these basic needs, okay? So, the, so to build a social fabric that's most conducive to those basic needs being met for everyone around the world, so the democratization of those things, leveraging AI, automation, those technologies to make those things as readily available as possible, okay? Then there needs to be some sort of a process for the discovery of that unique spirit that's in that seed to fully be able to identify what is the unique gift that it wants to express. Why did it adventure into consciousness here, in this body, in this beautiful piece of art called body, for it to bring these gifts forth? So we have these components that need to happen to enable the prosperity for all. So it seems as though then there's a moral burden, an ethical burden, a philosophical burden on not only, like you gave this example of trying to get these, the, these links, if you think of each one of these pieces of the chain, each one of these links 
to be able to actualize the ones at, that have the most resources right now, the ones that have the most power right now, have to have the feelings of being burdened, in a sense, of trying to build that social fabric that is most conducive towards the prosperity for all. So what do, what do we do in order to get these incremental steps in the next decade or so that ensure that prosperity for all? Well, I might be a romantic idealist, but uh, the way I see it, that when the universe came about and when a big ball of energy, it is naturally the progression is to find order, is to find the most optimal way to structure the universe in itself. How do we go from a big crazy ball of energy into through the Big Bang to create structures, to create time, to create uh, life? And what I like, what what comes to mind as you mentioned all this is a quote by Marcus Aurelius in Meditations where he says a horse runs, a bird flies, and a human just does good things. I think it's all in all of our nature uh, naturally to think about what we feel is morally beautiful and this just means what is valuable, what is more valuable than our own life in fact. How do we rank our own life in value in comparison to the other beautiful things in the world? And naturally what humans do is after we've thought about these values, then we act to, to optimize strategies to, to, uh, to maximize these. But the problem arises when, um, when there is a lack of opportunity uh, to even think about one's self uh, in such a metaphysical way when we are, uh, say, living on the streets or if we don't have uh, food or if our families are in danger, we don't even think about ourselves or where we uh, we don't have the luxury of thinking ab about values greater than our own immediate survival. So I feel like the question is not how do we um, spark this, because I believe all humans have that innate beautiful nature to find morality and to live for it and then uh, die happy. But the real question is how do we eliminate that which prevents people from reaching the levels of self-actualization. Mm. Uh, so. So it's a really hard problem, but you know, it's a really valuable one, <laughs> uh, would, no pun intended. <laughs> would you say then those obstacles are the lack of those basic needs being met when you don't have love, you don't have air, water, food, shelter, electricity, education? A hundred percent. And this is why even though I have a very uh, strong love for capitalism, uh, I also like uh, you had Andrew Yang on your podcast earlier before was talking about universal basic income. Where at the very least, those who are most disadvantaged in society, uh, who don't have the very fundamentals, uh, at the very least, a system would be there to uh, address that. I mean, I'm Canadian, so I can't speak much for our neighbors down south, but I thought that was very well thought out, uh, those uh, policy changes. And it's a really big issue because um, there's, n there's no one clear-cut answer and you're always going to piss off someone no matter what approach you take in that direction. Yeah. There's, I think, always a nuanced way to put this. Just like you began your statement by saying that you appreciate aspects of capitalism that have helped us get to where we are. Yet, we also realize that the way that in nature we see things like the redistribution of carbon that is sequestered by the largest trees through the roots and fungal systems to the little seedlings and the smaller trees that don't get to sequester as much carbon that same process of resource distribution is clearly not evident in human hierarchies of wealth is just not there and we have to be completely honest that it's not there and then we have to build the social fabric that makes it so that the obstacles that you're listing earlier where these fundamental needs are not being met in those root systems where they can be overcome so that people can when upon birth have the basic needs to identify what their north star what their purpose is and go on a trajectory to get there oh uh, that's that's a really remarkable way to put it uh, i do agree and that's I guess that's what makes the problem so fun. <laughs> yes. If it was really easy, then it wouldn't be worth one's whole life effort. <laughs> uh, I think the best way to find a, a good, uh, happy value to work towards is one that's just great enough where it seems like uh, it's almost impossible. But uh, I mean, if you achieve all of your life values, 
like trying to optimize all the things, what are you going to be left to optimize? <laughs> so it's good to have a really, really hard problem to solve. I think that's uh, what makes it fun. You can wake up and be like, oh, this, this is really fun. <laughs> and having that humility to say, oh, yes. even though one may never win the war, so to speak, uh, one must always do our best uh, with, with whatever we got. Yes. Yeah, I mean, what's the alternative? <laughs> Every moment going towards that big vision in a very selfless way that, uh, in a perspective that always keeps in mind the hundred billion humans before us that built civilization that we get, and that by the time that we pass ourselves, that we will be leaving it incrementally towards justice, um, incrementally towards prosperity, um, that we lived every single day building towards that is paramount. Um, okay, so the design of that fabric is really about the removal of the obstacles of removing poverty, of meeting the basic needs in education and all the other nutrients that are needed for the seed in order for that seed to flower. And that requires a big moral burden at, of those at the top that are leading the big companies that are leading the big governments that are the wealthiest people on the planet to uh, and we're going to get to this in a little bit in our conversation on the way that you're um, uh, collecting people's biometric states that uh, maybe it's important we've talked about this on the show quite a bit to see those those the people of the greatest power to be able to map how much empathy do they have how much spiritual awakening do they have how much deep ability to interconnect with other humans and nature <laughs> That's and really smart love, yeah you're have? right yeah because if we can measure those states and then prove um, when someone does not have those states maybe we can incrementally nudge their them in those directions of gaining more uh, of those states and then being able to see that in their biometrics and then their decisions towards redistributing those resources for empowerment rather than for self-dealing and conspicuous consumption will actually see that happen. You know, that's a really good way to put it because um, when we choose who we want to elect and who do we want to follow, uh, it's important not just to know their, their thoughts and what they speak, it's important to know their subconscious. So being able to leverage biometric technologies um, always with ethical consent mm -hmm. is important because it lets you get an insight into a person's uh, feelings. And we make most of our decisions, most of our actual purchasing power, um, purchasing decisions and general decisions in life based on what we intrinsically feel. Every time we are dealt with a, uh, a topic that might be sensitive or, or just any topic in general, all the logic has been processed in our prefrontal cortex, then processed into language, and then we have to actually speak it. A lot of that, of that pure emotion, that pure visceral gut feeling, is lost during the translation of language. I mean, I can smile uh, and I talk with like a, an excited tone, but what's really happening underneath? Um, if we want to have a true uh, access of um, transparency uh, to, uh, I guess, the elites <laughs> uh, like the the leaders, is it's gonna be, it's gonna be important to highlight this level of information. Uh, for all the stakeholders uh, in our democracy and around the world. Now that's, that's a really cool, um, cool topic. Yeah. yeah, I love this topic and it requires people that are building the biometric technologies with given the ethical consent like you're indicating. Yeah, I like think you that's, guys are that's doing. It's yeah. really important to not just do things legally, but above and beyond that, what is moral, what is the yeah. uh, principled way of doing things. Uh, in collecting such sensitive data, yes, I'd love to touch on that. Uh, when we, we get will, a chance. yeah, we're gonna get, we're gonna get to that. That's important to talk about. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the actual tech stacks that you're building to do so. Um, okay, so this is kind of the big picture vision: is getting a empowerment for every single child to be able to unleash their fullest gifts, to remove those obstacles, make those basic needs met. Um, around the world and then maximize that prosperity through that through that lens. Yeah. And I also really like the perspective of having a, we, for some reason we decided that my, uh, uh, my partner or my, uh, your partner, all of our partners, our spouses, whatever you want to say, they basically become everything. They have to be your emotional support, they have to be your, you know, your workout partner, they have to be your spiritual partner, they have to be your 
uh, business partner, they have to be your uh, everything for you. Uh, which puts a huge burden on, on, on each other when actually a good amount of that can be offloaded to um, AI, an AI coach that knows you actually better than your partner does in some ways and that actually can nudge you in the direction of, uh, of working out or of uh, or, um, reading those uh, couple <laughs> of dozen of pages that you have to get to, um, you know, et cetera. And that helps with those trajectories towards um, unleashing the North Stars. And I like your focus on AI coaches for every single seed that's bringing its fruit into the world. Yeah, ultimately, the limitations of a teacher, uh, no matter their natural brilliance in being a good teacher, is limited by the amount of knowledge that they know. Like, I cannot teach what I don't know. I cannot learn from someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> But with an AI approach, we're able to essentially map human knowledge, uh, crowdsource it, or really specialize knowledge sets, uh, and give this access to, uh, to AI algorithms to be able to learn uh, more effectively than a million teachers could. Um, I think Google just released their uh, quantum-based uh, chip that is apparently has quantum supremacy, <laughs> uh, which, which means that it can start processing and acquiring and analyzing data much greater greater speeds than imagined ever. Um, not to digress, but the brain is, has quantum uh, phenomenon happening in it, oh, yeah. uh, which is uh, a, cool, a cool digression. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I love that big picture focus. I th it's, it's such a vital part of where we're heading in our future. And then um, ultimately this becomes uh, a data science problem is the automation of, of optimal pedagogy on the child's direction towards their North Star. Yeah, uh, if, if I can touch on that, essentially the sum of what our work is doing, my, my team and I, are essentially trying to build personalized AI teaching systems that are able to map the sum of human knowledge as it's being released online and to essentially optimize personalized lesson plans uh, for each given individual's mood as it changes in real time. Uh, the unique learning styles. Uh, we envision the future of education looks something like kids playing a video game. Uh, the video games will react to their moods uh, to optimize their engagement. They're not going to want to eat, use the bathroom, do anything else but just play these games. But they're going to be learning mathematics, physics, calculus. Uh, we, spend, we see the number of hours kids are already spending on video games. So we're thinking, why don't we automate the process of teaching into a video game format and use the most cutting edge emotion sciences uh, to, to try to present uh, uh, this content in not just a way that's engaging, uh, but optimized for a person's unique learning styles. So each one of us should have a one-on-one -on -one mentor. Like we, as humans, we evolve to speak face to face. Like you can see my emotions change in real time uh, and then you can tailor our, our conversation to optimize my, our engagement but we really lost this in the industrialized revolution where like, we got one teacher to 30 students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no way one teacher can, can track and personalize a lesson to every student. And it gets even worse in the digital age with one teacher to like a million students. Uh, so using, using technology, we can actually bridge back that gap. Uh, but this is an extremely, extremely hard problem to solve because it requires a bunch of unsupervised approaches, uh, unsupervised machine learning approaches to map human knowledge and then to optimize yeah. personal lesson plans. So what our team recognizes is that before we try to build a, uh, an AI-based solution, we have to recognize that it's a, a data science problem, which means that you have to have a sufficient amount of data uh, to optimize any algorithm with. Oh, so yeah. our business model uh, which is important to keep in mind, that not just the theory, but how do you build sustainable, dominant businesses that let you reach your goals. So our business model today involves helping uh, other enterprises work with human data, uh, making human data easily accessible uh, for humans. Uh, and all must be done with ethical transparency uh, mm -hmm. above and beyond what is hidden in the terms of service. Uh, so it's very important to, to think about these uh, ethical concerns 
as we source data, uh, because we're ultimately we're working with technologies like eye tracking, facial tracking, brainwave data, heart rate data. Uh, these are all super personal data sets. And uh, we have a, a, a two rules in our company for any product that we build. Um, the first is extreme transparency. Uh, rather than hide acquisition of data legally in the terms of service, like some other big companies might do, uh, we, our philosophy is to make sure that any user uh, who's going to be giving us their data knows downright in the marketing. Uh, so there's no step of the interaction with any companies that, that the, uh, that's sort of hidden. You never want someone to be taken by surprise. Mm -hmm. And the second is to ask ourselves, if we build this technology, do I want my little brother or my little sister using it? And then once it matches those two criteria, I find that um, that's, gen that's generally a semi, semi foolproof way to approach this. Yeah, we're always looking for better ways to, <laughs> to do things more ethically and, and uh, in a more philosophically sound way. But uh, yeah, acquiring data and working with, uh, with um, new alternative data, it's, it's important to think about the future uh, ethical concerns uh, and, and execute them today rather than just sort of run fast and break things, <laughs> so to speak, in, in this respect. Yeah. yeah, I think I digressed a bit there. I <laughs> love that synthesis. So I love your vision with it too. So, all right, so we have uh, Bloom 2 Sigma, which is such an important phenomenon. So we need the one-on-one -on -one mentorship with every single one of the young people that's trying to actualize their gifts. Clear, not one to 30. Um, but we need a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with every single one, okay? And then we need also to leverage the new technologies like augmented reality, all these new fields that are emerging, um, having neurofeedback uh, towards you, uh, uh, reaching your goals as well. Um, this, this learning in these, in these three-dimensional spaces um, of play uh, and uh, that's a big one as well. And then we have um, just this overall ability to map civilization's knowledge, try and be able to identify at a young age when this child's born, what do they want to be exposed to? Which areas of play do they want to learn and, and see what they like? And then if they like those more, you enter them deeper and deeper into those areas and see if that's it. And then they, they've I, more and more identified with their field that they want to pursue. And then that's when you know, you, you're doing things very ethically along this way that the child knows, the parents know that, that the data that you guys are working with is very, it's very, um, it's important to be ethical. And so you, you make it clear that all these biometrics that are coming in, that it's all very transparent. This is crucial along, along the process. Absolutely. Yeah, you really hit the hammer on the, the nail's head. I think that's the saying. Yeah. And just what's kind of disgusting to see today is many companies, they recognize the value of data, uh, but they don't treat the data as, as the user's ownership. Uh, I think now it's good we're starting to see a lot of awareness that your data is your data. Is You should have a sense of ownership and control over it. So we just want to take that to the extreme and treat it not just as a property right, but as a human right. Uh, our data is like, it's kind of like, a universal basic asset that we can actually get um, ownership of and then potentially compensated for. Um, yeah. It could be part of that universal basic income no. is our asset of data. Absolutely. Yeah. To give you a really negative, scary example, uh, there's a company called why do we have to Why do we have to do the negative, scary well, example? Well, as, as a warning, uh, there's a... Okay. I mean, I yeah, am, like to, to see how to this... Uh, towards the positive <laughs> direction of prosperity. Oh, I yes. understand like the importance of giving the examples of fear, but I think it's so much more important to guide us towards. Yeah, I think on a first principles basis of the things we talked about, that's that's pretty important. Just rather than uh, sort of framing things in one thing or another. Fear, yeah. Hopefully, uh, you guys in the audience can. They know. Uh, like People already know that. about what is the all of these malevolent uh, yeah, malevolences and all of the. 
fears and all of the panics and catastrophes and p negative potentials. People have already heard so many of those examples. Like, let's just focus <laughs> That's on... That's true. That's the daily news right there. It's the daily you know? news. Oh, boy. So it's the daily I can, I can respect that we want to focus on a positive On the shedding. positive trajectory. What's the potential? Moving forward. So I, my question on this front is, how do you guys figure out how to map civilization's knowledge using unsupervised machine learning? How do you then understand what my, you know, how do you, how do I play with all of the different possible edges of, of knowledge and then figure out what my unique gift is I want to bring? How do I use your AI coach, et cetera? Yeah, well, I think the best way to approach this is with humility and say that the past couple hundred years of pedagogical sciences is not really a science, more of an art. Mm -hmm. Teachers come out with hypotheses and then putting it into the classroom with really small data feedback with non-replicable experiments. So what we're trying to do is essentially build uh, data that correlates human behavior uh, using biometrics mm -hmm. with how do we interact with media, how do we interact with each other, how do we build a uh, large enough critical mass of data that lets us begin to use unsupervised analysis to model what are the meta variables that govern human engagement, human learning? Uh, how do emotion, stress, anxiety, your personality types, uh, your political bias, uh, all the different things that quantifi quantifies a human, uh, whether it's your heart rate, uh, all the different biometric and personality, uh, yes. inner, external nature, uh, and how do these correlate with uh, actions, behavior, in response to an extremely diverse set of uh, attention economy assets like film, media, online courses, uh, advertisements, not a very cool industry, but it's mm -hmm. pretty big. Uh, so the idea is by understanding um, how do people react in general, then we can begin to uh, optimize uh, performance. Uh, so our business model today involves collecting, helping other companies uh, in the attention economy that already have networks uh, to add in a layer of emotional data. Because uh, mm. taking a step back to build a personalized AI teacher is a multi-decade vision. Yes. Uh, and if we try to launch that today, uh, this is a cold start problem. Yes. We need a sufficient amount of data to launch it, but we're also building a business, a startup, uh, and an entrepreneurial journey. Uh, to create zero from one, or no, one from zero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not the other way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the idea is our business today involves helping enterprises uh, that already have networks, uh, but could use emotional data into their networks to optimize it. Um, the problem is that these technologies are rather new. Uh, facial tracking, brainwave tracking, heart rate tracking. So most companies, they don't have the in-house specializations to build these solutions and to deploy them and to ethically source them. So that's where we come in. We go there and almost do a lightning consultancy analysis for any given company, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's one of our Fortune 500 clients, government agencies or nonprofits, and we customize an end-to-end -end solution where our engineers and scientists just think what's the best way to incorporate an emotional data layer, and then we build our technology out there. So the idea is, by being able to deploy these uh, emotion solutions across industries and to build a team of talented scientists and engineers. Uh, <laughs> send me a message on LinkedIn if you guys, anyone wants to join. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> sorry, I had to throw That's that That's a great in. plug, no, please do, yeah. <laughs> uh, the idea is to centralize a team of super brilliant people and that become eventually over the contracts, over the clients, over the years, uh, we become experts in working with emotional data, collecting and centralizing uh, emotions and human reactions to it in an ethical and politically sound way, then we would be able to solve the cold start problem of identifying how do we, uh, what type of algorithms are best, give the best performance on this type of real-time human data set. It's like everyone's trying to create an artificial intelligence uh, that's like general AGI but no one really understands what it means to be a human yet. And the best way to understand what it means to have human consciousness uh, across demographics, across age, across nationality, across gender is to collect the data first <laughs> uh, and to build a business that is sustainable so that we can eventually scale up uh, to do much greater things. So it's 
like it's almost being humble and saying oh this is what we know this is what we don't know this is what we can do and what we can do let's be the best in the world at it uh, yeah. which is what we call emotions as a service <laughs> I love that yeah, yeah emotion as a service E A A S yeah, yeah e- it's like software as a service all yeah. Yeah. so no, one. Y- yeah, y- yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Instead of SaaS. Yeah. yeah. I I love how you put it as a emotional layer um, that has to be applied to uh, governments, uh, uh, nonprofits, um, Fortune 500 companies, just around the world. An emotional layer. So basically, all of the data that's coming in from the Internet of Things, smartphones, AR, blah, 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 autonomous cars, it's coming from everywhere now. There's got to be some sort of a way to measure my mood, my emotional (laughs) state from all this data and then be able to like a like a very like a very easy way of like if there's a way to get my my heart rate variability or my um, my EEG just if there's ways to simply get these pieces of data or just having the sensors in the room etc all these different places IOT that can then do things like Alan you, we're sensing a slightly higher stress levels so there's now going to be a spray of lavender into the room or now there's going to be some jazz music that's played or now um, we're going to um, um, open up to one of your favorite um, readings or, or videos etc um, take a little bit of time to stretch and relax. You know, just this is really not, it is rocket science because you need the big corpus of the layer of emotion, the massive catalog to make it so that you actually know when someone's feeling stressed or you know when someone's feeling tired or you know when they're feeling happy or you know when they're on a really good f- path of focus towards their goal. And to have that AI coach actually tailor these experiences, like you're saying, you gotta build in this multi-decade long process this big catalog of the emotions, mm. 100% ethically, like you said. But it's not fucking rocket science at the same time because you don't need to have all these scientific reports about nature therapy being good for people to know to just get out of the tiny little rat cage cubicle you're in (laughs) and go to the trees, go to the beaches, go to the places where you will feel like you are interconnected with everything. Uh, I think uh, the reason why we are locked in these... um suboptimal frameworks is we grew up in a society where we really emphasize IQ, productivity, rationality, but we're not taught almost never in the public education system to use our EQ, to develop our heart, to develop our internal sense of how do I feel about this? Um, Maybe that was not not what, I mean, in the industrialized era, you know, people are trying to turn out cogs in a machine. Uh, so the whole education system has been really geared to uh, get people to think uh, externally about uh, and try to be a productive member in society, you know, grow your IQ, but without a lack of any emotional training, lack of yeah. any self-mastery. Yeah. And yeah, you know, this, uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about one of the social impact projects we're working Let's with do it. in regards to emotional self-mastery. I love it. Because uh, the Dalai Lama has made this one of his crucial points as well as the emotional self-mastery. Yeah. Why is it not being taught at the first moments of birth on? on? Oh. Um, That'd be a great person yeah. to partner with. I'm sure we can learn a lot from some of the yes. meditations and philosophies that they've developed. Yes. Um, one of the um, social impact projects they were working on is how do we help recently uh, release incarcerated individuals or people who are currently in the prison system get a better sense of self-mastery. And our solution is uh, personalized guided meditation to help recently released inmates that are in halfway houses or even in within the prison system itself. It's a very vulnerable population. Yeah. And how do we give them the tools they need to, uh, to stop and think and uh, go explore themselves internally and to ultimately get a better sense of self-mastery. I mean, we could all really use that uh, to be able to uh, develop our own internal uh, fortitude, so to speak. And so even though the technology can be applied in almost every single industry, uh, that emotional data layer, 
we have to ask ourselves what is what does society really need the most right now and uh, above and beyond profits and revenues how can we uh, work on really game-changing products that can potentially alleviate the suffering of, of countless people I mean the, the big reason why most people are incarcerated to begin with is not through their own fault it is through uh, trauma and abuse and neglect as children that's what the statistics and experiments and studies yeah. show um, and being a uh, being incorporated within the prison or uh, within the, the the prison system there's really very little avenue to break out of that circle uh, they call it a revolving door because yep. people leave the prison system and then they don't have the, the resources the skills the support yes. uh, they need to uh, to break out of that trap, you know, that, that self-defeating anger and trap. You're providing the intervention at the most critical time uh, where it can alter their trajectory out of the revolving door and towards their North Star. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, wh what a great thing about working on self-mastery tools is we are all humans, whether we're uh, incarcerated, whether we're a student, whether we're in old age. Uh, by building the same core principles of optimizing a person's self-awareness, uh, giving them feedback on their own neural uh, and physiological behavior, we can translate a lot of these learnings and uh, product features uh, from, say, from the prison industry into the education industry, into the mental health industry. Uh, so it's like many ways to yeah. understand and optimize a human performance. I mean, like, I'm a human. I don't even know what it means to be a human. That's how tricky the problem is. Yes, it's like yes, meta yes. on meta on meta. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so it seems as though when we take in the mass amount of data in terms of emotions and what it means to be human in this grand scale, what it how we can basically log biometrics and emotional states and show which biometrics of heart, gut, brain, etc. have to do with which states of emotion. So it's a big catalog. Then the when you have the AI coach making the recommendations for people, it's making it based on a very strong catalog of states where it knows that if these are the biometrics that are being shown, then it means this state. And if this person feels like they want to get closer to their North Star during that state, then I will provide this as an intervention right now. That's the feedback loop. Yeah, and the AI, the AI's brain will be thinking, what is the probability given the current state of the inputs? What is the probability of the decision making that's gonna optimize the end performance? Yes. Whether it's learning a particular subject or learning a particular skill. Um, this is just a human brain can't process all that data <laughs> uh, and, yes. and, and, not, and, and do it scalably. That's so, why we have the algorithms that already know us better than we know ourselves. <laughs> I don't know where I was a month ago. I don't know where I was a year ago. I don't know what I ate a month ago. What Google I ate knows. A, Google knows, Facebook knows, blah, 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 yep. et cetera. They, they just know, and I, I don't. I don't know who I was messaging that day. I don't know what I was messaging yeah. them. Don't they know can, what I want to buy. <laughs> what I want to buy. The emotional sentiment as well um, regarding all those messages, right? When I was messaging you, um, uh, what was my emotional sentiment, etc. cetera, um, being able to parse that through NLP. I mean, there's so much data there um, that I'm not aware of. And our, like you said, our processing systems aren't as capable. But uh, let's, let's get to this. Um, uh, the emotional layer itself is you're already starting to work with companies that, that want you to embed. So you're doing like a custom uh, a custom built build out for the yeah. companies to build in the emotional layer ethically with them and then taking the data from there to build out the big catalog oh, absolutely okay. and we select our clients extremely exclusively we have to make sure that they're the right uh, philosophical fit um, because we don't want everyone to empower any firms who don't have that core dedication to protecting uh, their human users privacy uh, so what we specialize for our clients is white label, turnkey, uh, full end-to-end -end solutions 
using whatever technologies they feel is best. Uh, what that we, uh, after our analysis, we prescribe a certain amounts of uh, strategies that they can embark on, whether it's to use eye tracking, facial tracking, brainwave data, heart rate data. So every client is a unique beast. And I think the best is to, is to think, hey, if the client's business was my business, how do, how, how do we optimize from here, given the technology and the skills? And it's hard because anytime a client, anytime a business in general wants to work with any one of these technologies, they have to hire a PhD, you're going to spend months and potentially years developing and testing a product or, um, or working with an external consultancy that and ultimately ends up uh, owning all of the uh, code and not giving them the empowerment. So what we, what we do is we go in there and we, we do our own consultancies uh, and we develop white label turnkey solutions to empower their brand, empower their users. Uh, so we're called Atlas Holdings because it's a pretty boring name. And uh, like there's a saying that you can go really far if you give other people the credit. <laughs> and um, Oh yeah, you, everything's your fault when it goes wrong and nothing is your credit when it goes right. That's how to be a good person. Well, I think <laughs> we all have to ask ourselves, are we are we building something for the credit or are we building yeah. something for impact? <laughs> for what transcends us for the rest of humanity. That's, yeah. And if that's the answer, then you will have great support from other people. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not so sure if your audience members have read uh, Anne Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged, mm. where she talked about, she's a philosopher uh, in the 19th century, where she talked about what happens if the most uh, productive people in society uh, shrug the weight of the world. Um, because Atlas was a Greek god that carried the world on his shoulders. That's right. Um, but I don't think that's always the best way to approach things. So mm -hmm. with Atlas Holdings, it's almost like a symbolical uh, tribute to Rand, but also to say, hey, what happens if the most uh, dedicated uh, people in the world um, saw that it is worth it to, to do what they feel is best for the rest of humanity? That's right. It's like a good North Star. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so Atlas but Holdings. <laughs> that, ta that talks about the burden. Atlas is also a big catalog of all of the emotional states and, uh, and the, the biometrics that are associated with that. But it's also that the, it is upon the ones that have the most, um, especially around the world, to be the most uh, benevolent in the uh, maximizing prosperity moving forward. And... I want you to give a couple of these analyses. You listed these things called, you know, facial um, tracking, facial recognition, or eye tracking, facial recognition, um, emotional sentiment. How do you, um, as much as you can, can you give us an example of where you're making the emotional layer at a company? Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. Why don't I talk about Resound? Oh, it's the world's first Perfect. automated platform for focus groups. Yes. Uh, so right now, focus groups are a really big industry. Uh, but to run a focus group, you have to, uh, send out a bunch of ads, hire people locally, bring them to a laboratory physically, and to and then you pay them about 16 bucks an hour to scan their emotions. And you normally do this through another company, so it's a very long process to uh, get a focus group running. So what we've done is we built an app where we hire uh, about 600 to 700 biometric freelancers that get paid to download our app and then get paid to watch videos as we track their emotions in real time. Mm -hmm. So it's a way for people to sell us through mutual consent, their facial expressions, their yes. eye tracking, they know exactly what how much money they're for, getting. How uh, much money they're getting. They, you know, and then it's their choice to say, oh, I think it's worth my time, like a dollar an hour or seven dollars an hour, depending on the content, on how engaging the content is. Yeah. Uh, so essentially what we do is we have decentralized and fully automated the process of the focus group industry. And this lets us deliver uh, a human attention uh, minute per dollar uh, at yeah. about a hundred times to a thousand times less than our competitors. Yeah. Uh, it also allows us to do really interesting things like analyze the emotions of crowd behavior around the world uh, versus traditional focus groups and research groups and traditional neuroscience where it's focused to one demographic. Um, so one thing that's interesting is we can see how different uh, cultures react to, say, racism. Yes. Uh, we can see in North America, there's a big civil rights movement, uh, which is beautiful because when we show racist imagery to people in North America, 
uh, almost across the board, it's just big frowns, scrowns, like, that's not cool, that's not right. Yeah. But we also see in countries where there is not a very developed sense of civil rights, when racist imagery is shown, there's maybe a smile or, or, a, or just no, no response as well. Yeah. Uh, we can also do things where we analyze gender, how different genders react to really controversial and, and painful subjects like uh, we ran an experiment wow where we tried what you just said it was so interesting because it all, we swing uh, albeit quite deeply into traumas of the uh, initial millions of indigenous people that were here over 500 years ago um, and the way that they've been um, killed and displaced and then we do the transatlantic slave trade trauma and then because of those things and then what happened with the southwestern part of the United States and, um, and uh, Mexico and uh, Latin America, et cetera, um, we swing all the way into the depths of that trauma and because we do, we're swinging in so far in the civil rights direction for um, the indigenous, for Latin America, for um, uh, Africa, uh, for uh, uh, women's rights, for gay rights, etc. Uh, so it's so interesting that so then we, in a sense, become at the forefront uh, absolutely. of that civil rights. It's like it's that's like so interesting. Yeah, being say, a, um, if one has say been in a fight and really beat up someone to a pulp, then you can stop and grow and reflect and say, hey, look, that was really not the behavior that I want or am to embody uh, as I grow and evolve and find my level of moral uh, growth uh, versus uh, a man or woman who's never been in a conflict or done things that they might be ashamed of. Then they have no context of how do we uh, grow as an individual. Uh, there's no differentiation of right or wrong. Yeah. Um, so I think very much having made a lot of painful, painful mistakes in the past uh, as a culture. Uh, the culture grows and evolves and defines its, its greater form. And it's, and it's like in an earlier part of our conversation, like the universe tends towards uh, greater moral order. It's like the same as the human mind and the yeah. human society and the human uh, as, a, as, a, as a whole. So I'm really optimistic because anytime we make really bad mistakes as a species... We say good. We, yeah, we say like, oh, got to like move on. Let's just move on. And like, how do we... Like what's best for our children? What's best for the I, future? I love that <laughs> phrase by uh, uh, Jocko. He's, Jocko, yeah, he's, well, I, he I listen that to that podcast so all good. the time. He he, that's so great that he right after someone says something that went horrible or miserable or bad, he goes good. Let's move on. Good, good, because it's all learning experience. It's all yeah. I have a, I have another point just around what you were just talking about. It's so important to bring this up. You have a way of seeing the internal state, the consciousness of the person. Through biometrics, you can, you can objectively begin cataloging conscious states. And so then when you see that the person is not uh, experiencing states of like uh, feelings of of sadness or 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 uh, or just a uh, disgust when they see the, the racism happening, then you know that there is something that's different. Like, what is their state of consciousness when they're not feeling that versus when they are feeling that? So these are different states of biometrics and consciousness. And then you want to, you know, if we're trying to move people towards a more just society towards one where there isn't that racism where there isn't those obstacles then there is, is some sort of a way to create through an ai coach learning around that evolutionary process for people so it's just it's just so interesting basically there's there's a a once you get the states of emotion and the states of biometric and consciousness so you have these once we're completely honest with ourselves <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Once we have that, and then we have how we want to uh, have an AI coach nudge us towards our North Stars along our journey, we have these th things harmonize. And we're. <sighs>
No, it, it, it's, it's important because today we see the left and the right. I see values in both approaches, but there is no conversation. There's no sense of commonality. And I think the problem is everyone has their own biases, but not everyone's aware of their own biases. So by the idea is to essentially um, use a lot of our technology to, to, create, to create a sense of self-awareness. Like, oh, you know, uh, like without judgment, because it's, it's, a, it's an AI. <laughs> like, uh, uh, if we just show you how you're feeling, like, we're not saying anything bad or good, we're just saying, hey, here's the data. You make the human decision on there, yeah. uh, in many cases. So there's a lot of uh, directions that this can be taken in the whole industry of emotional technology and emotional human performance optimization. It's, it's in its infancy, it's really, really young. Human optimization through human data. Yeah. And even at the level of these focus groups, like you're saying, I like that example a lot. It seems su way more efficient, getting people paid, super transparent. Oh, yeah. Then they can quit their, their job that they don't care about and sell their data. Like, as we mentioned earlier, data is a, it's a human right. Um, and it's like the, the right to your own body. It doesn't matter if you own your own body, if, you, if no one, if you don't have the right to a marketplace to sell and buy food and trade. So what we're trying to do is create the platform where people can own their own data and monetize on it. Uh, so the future of work might be uh, you sitting and, and watching uh, videos or playing games and selling your data through consent to people who can use that for predictive analytics to drive their uh, content creation, drive their marketing. Uh, as long as it's all done with extreme transparency and to empower the end user with all the ownership uh, of their own data, I think then it, is, it can be deployed in a very uh, useful way for humanity. Um, I would talk about the negatives, <laughs> I'll leave you guys to imagine that. Yeah. You know, the, the negative ways that these technologies can be used if they're not done with an ethical principle. And um, in a community I'll talk about very shortly, Neurotech X, we spent the last four or five years really digging into all the different ethical considerations, the ways that these technologies, like brainwave data, all the different biometrics can be ethically and reasonably uh, deployed uh, on a business and a, and a human sense. Uh, but, uh, but I won't dive right into that just yet. I'll get lost in a digression after digression. We talked about this a little bit earlier too, and I really want to know how to be able to get these things implemented as soon as possible. You have, like we were talking about, emotional states, states of consciousness, along with their biometric states that represent them, excellent. Then you have um, the certain ways of, of, uh, of when you watch something like someone um, getting physically violated, that someone feels like uh, they're in pain themselves, they have empathy, um, or they feel like smiling, and, and so what? What do you you know? What do you do in that scenario? How do you how do you catalyze that awakening for someone to feel more empathy? Same thing with these global ruling elite that we were talking about earlier. How do we map the emotional and biometric states um, of consciousness to see how much they care about other people? They care about unconditional. Love, they care about maximizing prosperity moving forward versus their own self dealing tendencies, and so to be able to make the AI coach's recommendations towards um, a, a prosperous future. You know, those are some of the examples. Um, you know, you give the example about, about data as well, being a human right. Well, how do we make it so that every single person is able to take what is their own uh, emotion and consciousness and biometric data and be able to decide when they want to open those valves and let that data go to researchers and to, um, to doing that process of maximizing prosperity, getting properly compensated for it, having that be transparent. I mean, these are the most pressing questions of, some of the most pressing questions of the exponential technology agent, some of the most pressing questions of the movement towards AI coaches uh, in general. It seems like you're taking a really good first principled angle, not only with data ethics, and transparency, but also about getting people paid for their data rights, but also about starting with the big emotional layer yeah. um, to get the best data no, for the AI coaching. Yeah. I know, I think uh, philosophy is the first step, but it's useless without 
proper business model generation. <laughs> Not to sound too cliche, uh, but if we want to execute our moralities, we have to, um, a as a business, uh, my team and I have the challenge of figuring out ways to get this to market, to scale it, and to start uh, making something valuable today um, with, with the ethics, but uh, not always relying fully on the goodwill uh, or, or, or philosophies or what is nice. Um, so yeah, to, 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 I guess to answer your question of what, how do we say make um, say some of the global elites, some of the presidents, uh, some of the industry leaders more aware of their uh, own empathy or lack thereof, um, and how do we improve that? I think the first step is, uh, I like to always say, the first step to change requires self-awareness. If you don't know you're making a mistake, uh, if you don't know that something you're, you're doing something uh, because of your subconscious bias, that's always, uh, there's no real way to actively uh, grow yourself as an individual. And real change never comes from someone coming from the outside. Uh, like real true change comes from when you mm. think about something and you compare uh, the possibilities of what you could be if you eliminated a behavior or adopted another behavior. Uh, but I would be lying if, uh, if, 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 we, if I say we knew the right answer. So our first step is to sort of build self-mastery tools yeah. that help students, that help uh, incarcerated people yeah. uh, gain a better sense of self-mastery. And uh, I love yeah. that. It's a really hard problem, but it's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Because you're a human trying to understand humans. Uh, well, try, you're a human trying to teach an AI to understand humans. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, the meta yeah. layers that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Again, it seems as though um, having humans be able to more. Uh, oh no! Very yes, kind yes, of you. Yes, Thank yes, you. Yes, yes. I love your questions, by the way. They're really, really on point yeah. and and uh, exponential questions. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why do you go like this instead of like like this? Oh, I guess uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I've got Chinese ancestry. So is that what this do this is a sign of uh, respect, saying hey. I see you, recognize you as a person. The, f uh, the ones the, the fist and ones the palm. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I believe the, the Thai people do that. The namaste. Versus the, this one. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I really love just doing that, like, respect. I respect the divine in you, however I can no, do absolutely. that. absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, I always try to call everyone, uh, sir, ma'am or brother sister, sister yeah. Um, yeah me too because I find that uh, it never hurts one to uh, give a bit of kindness into the world yes yes I mean uh, if anyone ever abuses you gotta have the strength to stand your own and, yeah. uh, and destroy and you take any away I guess but, but um, <laughs> always as a natural default it's important to uh, spread yeah. that sense of respect it's like a, yeah. a pool that we all drink from if we go around like making enemies or like spreading a negativity around we're sucking pool. from it yeah rather than exactly. contributing water which is kindness to exactly it. yeah it's yeah. like a giant yeah. communal pool that we're all going to sit yeah. from or our children will sit from we talked about several times the challenge that we are currently at as a society in this reality we are at this beautiful moment of challenge is it the exact purpose of creation or source or God or the universe or the multiverse or whatever you want to call it is for us to be at this exact beautiful point of challenge? I like to think that this beautiful moment is constantly moving, constantly evolving and the concept of God is really the sum of all of this movement. Yes. Uh, as we progress uh, back and forth through time. Uh, so I think that things are always the way they should be. Uh, I think trying to always imprint our subjective perspectives on things and say, oh, this is, uh, this shouldn't happen. Uh, you know, to say something shouldn't happen is almost self-defeating because this is just what the reality is. And as a part of that reality, we have a decision as to whether we want to uh, try to solve that for the future or 
let these uh, inefficiencies happen as we see fit. So it's, uh, I think it's probably impossible for the part, like the cell in the body, to understand uh, what the whole human body is doing. But each cell in our human body has a choice of whether it wants to keep being a cell. Uh, I like to, this might be a bit extreme, but I sometimes say that even a rock has consciousness because if the rock didn't know that it was supposed to stay in a certain geometric atomic formation, uh, how would it remain a rock? Why, why doesn't its proton just blast off in somewhere else? Um, but no, I, oh, you, go ahead. Do you, do you think that we are all one? I, I believe that we are all one and uh, disconnected in the sense that that disconnection is part of our oneness. Mm -hmm. uh, that, then, that we are parts of a giant network. And as a part, we have our individual autonomy, our character, our subjective life perspective. Uh, but that we are all also alive in the greater sense of the universe, such that even after we die, we are still part of that same giant network uh, as it transforms. Like life is like energy uh, when we die, like even if we become a rock, that rock is still part of a greater interconnectedness. And uh, that's enough for me, because uh, yeah, that, that's enough for me to, to be able to live and die happily, I think. So we're all one, and there's unique essences or spirits to each of us as well. No, 100%. Like even a cat or a dog or any rock in itself is a separate entity, but at the same time, in equal measure, connected with everything else. So it's a, it's a, a, okay. a, a, a contradiction of, of a dichotomy. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the way I see it. Within yeah. the deep oneness and interconnectedness are separations that can be combinatoricized in an infinite amount of ways. Yeah, and our perceptions, our individual perceptions of the world uh, really determine what the next step of the network is going to take, whether it's a, 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 superposition, a superpositioned uh, beam of energy, <laughs> whether it is, uh, I guess I, I won't go too much in stuff I don't really know, I don't want to misrepresent any quantum physicists, you know, <laughs> writing the comments, this guy, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but uh, my feeling is that um, each of us, the way we perceive the world as a part of it, uh, determines how we move forward uh, and how the network evolves and grows. So, yeah. like perception, understanding ourselves uh, first uh, gives us a much more uh, solid way to perceive the rest of the world. Absolutely. Like I'd love understanding our own consciousness first. I loved your focus on self mastery throughout this conversation. I love your company's focus on self mastery um, mm. being the first one of these first big principles um, about evolution is self-mastery. Know thyself, know thy North Star, uh, and know thy steps along the way to get there, um, all that type of stuff. A hundred percent. And to be a bit poetic, it's like when the beam of energy has become self-aware, that's when it breaks down its uh, superposition and becomes something real. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna get flack for that one, I know. <laughs> Wait, one more time, say it again. Um, when, uh, when this, like, as a poem, you know, it's a yeah. poetic way to think about it. When an object is in superposition, uh, when it finally figures out what it wants to be, yes. <laughs> uh, when it solidifies its uh, perspective, so to speak, whether it's like a, uh, like it an col atom you or collapse, <laughs> you collapse into one direction. Into one. <clears throat> uh, that's probably not an accurate. <clears throat> way, but it's a nice philosophical. I agree. It's poetic and scientifically accurate. So um, we are in a state of superposition with our North Star trajectory until we make the decision to message Ben and invite him on the show. Then the show happens. Oh and yeah. 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 Uh, or to create a show like this, like when the etc. Yeah. Like when the human will is focused, <laughs> that's when a lot of action and the like, results. We're can constantly be. collapsing the yeah. probabilities. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is when we don't think about ourselves, we remain superposition, reacting to the world, rather than sort of formulating and forming something into it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, it's like philosophical science poetry. Yeah, exactly. Do you think that the most upstream issue that we face as a society in this reality is our 
uh, lack of understanding of the oneness, our feelings of separation, our lack of feelings of interconnectedness? Uh, I think the biggest issue facing our generation is a lack of opportunities in an increasingly uh, unequal world where we're going to see automation, we're going to see a digital uh, AI revolution, and we're going to see massive populations of people displaced and left without a means to uh, survive. And that's only the result of this from a game theory perspective is warfare, uh, rioting, uh, widespread poverty. So I think the biggest uh, problem that we're facing is to uh, fix the, uh, like how do we take care of those who really need the help? Because don't, those who don't need the help, we're, all, we're, we're gonna find our own sense of uh, moral beauty, whether it's becoming an actor, whether it's becoming a gardener. Um, but the biggest uh, impediment to increasing human morality and human consciousness, I believe, is the lack of opportunities that our current generation is moving uh, in the direction we're heading towards. And so this is why I'm very emboldened by, uh, say, people who really try to focus on empowering those who, who could really use the help. Yeah. So then the most pressing thing is to be able to deliver a, a powerful social fabric that is most conducive for the actualization of all the spirits that are birthed into it um, and, uh, and leveraging that um, in uh, our... That's what we want. That's it. Yeah, that's that's it. It's hard problem to solve. Um, but it's doable, you know. People are aware of it. <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> aware of the yeah. problem. Yeah, I, I I like that that focus. Um, um, we can pass a little bit of time now on uh, uh, Neurotech X, your um, initiative to make BCIs. Uh, more accessible to people in community as well as FEV, your founders and entrepreneurs of Vancouver community? Uh, absolutely. Uh, what, what I would recommend is anyone in the audience who is sort of interested in biometric technology or working with biometric devices to check out the NeurotechX community. We've got thousands of scientists around the world that are super supportive. Uh, we just believe in trying to provide networking resources, opportunities, for anyone interested in this really young field of brain-computer interfaces, uh, I'm currently trying to help us uh, launch a marketplace to centralize brain-computer interface devices uh, such that our NeurotechX community has a much cheaper and faster and easier way to find the right devices for them. Uh, I also help uh, found the NeurotechX uh, Vancouver chapter. Uh, so it's a local community if you're in Vancouver, feel free to join our meetup group. Uh, we happen to be the largest in Western Canada, but mm. what is nice is we're all over the world in basically almost every major city, like 30 chapters around the world. Um, so yeah, I think the, the beautiful thing about having a community to support you is uh, if you ever need help, if you ever have ideas, you need to find partnerships, you need to find people to hire, people to work for, projects you want to build, having a community around you is the surest way to succeed in your career and supporting and growing a community you believe in, it's rewarding, yeah. Uh, and another community that, uh, that I've founded in Vancouver is called the FAV Group, the Founders and Entrepreneurs of Vancouver. Kind of cheesy name, but uh, essentially being a CEO, being an executive, being a founder is extremely, uh, it can be really lonely and difficult and hard at times. So uh, what I decided was why don't we bring um, a group of us together, we're about a hundred large now. Uh, we have businesses all across the, the range of industries. And then we just get together to do like silly things like detonate a bunch of high explosives, uh, or like sh do target shooting, or eat dinner, or like do archery tag, or go for wine and dine. Um, so building that sense of network, growing the community around you, uh, and really caring about how do you grow a community that adds value to all the members, that's a uh, it's been instrumental in growing, say, my own career. Yeah. Uh, so I recommend that anyone who's out there find your community, uh, a community of people who share your values, uh, hopefully transhumanism, 
and um, and try to grow it and <laughs> try to like give back and be able to do what you do what you can with it. Yeah. I love your focus on community and the importance of that along our North Star trajectories is crucial. So when you have an AI coach that's assisting you along the way, it's also going to be, it seems very important to also have uh, humans along the way. Uh, and so um, it's a big question of our time as well. Uh, what will be the future? Um, with humans and uh, given the area of expertise that humans can do better than general intelligence slowly shrinking over time. Yeah, and uh, the good thing is and everyone who's listening to this is a human and that means that they can make a big change in the world if they, they value and think about what they want to do and to do their best to do it. I mean, even if no one succeeds, it's still worth the effort because that's the human spirit. <laughs> to just keep doing what we think is the best uh, and the most moral thing to do, reach that North Star, so to speak, despite the adversities. I, that's so crucial. And then also the way that you've been explaining what you're doing with Atlas Holdings is, I think, a really good uh, way of uh, people watching or listening to think about tackling some of the biggest issues that are facing our world because you're coming from such a deep first principled way of viewing it which is that if i want to help with this ai coach to bring people to the north stars i have to start with building the most robust uh, data set of emotions and conscious experiences with biometrics possible then then uh, be extremely ethical about and transparent about data getting people paid for data rights, all this type of stuff at the most foundational layer, then actually doing the process of the AI coaching and helping people get there and all that type of stuff um, and helping all these companies build emotional um, layers in the process. I mean, it's just a very strong way of, of, um, of approaching one of these big issues. You no, know, our team has really done our best to optimize this and uh yeah, so our team is, we've got some really brilliant people helping us on our team. Um, so I can't take any of all, all the credit for that. Yeah, shout out to the Atlas Holdings team and, and, <laughs> and also just shout out in general. Um, we uh, need to build that social fabric that is most conducive for everyone actualizing their gifts and to make it at a time of automation and AI coming in, we gotta make it happen as soon as possible. Oh. Um, and, uh, and keep an, on the positive prosperity directional arrow um, as much as we can. So, yeah. yeah. This was really solid. Yeah. It was very enlightening. Really, really happy to be here and to, to share, our, share our work with you and your audience. Um, Thanks, Ben. It's really, really wonderful to see your podcast spreading the message of transhumanism, getting that North Star, getting people thinking about what is possible with exponential technologies. There's just so much that can be done today. <laughs> Ethical, moral, philosophical transhumanism. Yes, with uh, business model evolution. Yeah, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much for coming on the program. Likewise. Thank, Thank you. you for hosting. It's been Thank wonderful. You. Yeah, some, some of the best questions I've ever been asked here. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. And some of the best strategies on tackling the oh. most pressing challenges. Ever yeah, faced. our team is doing the best we can. Thank you. That's all we can do. <laughs> the best yeah. we can. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know what you're thinking. We would love to hear from you about all the things that Ben was teaching us about AI, emotion technologies, using human data to optimize human performance. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out atlasholdings.fund. Check out neurotechx.com. Also check out Ben's profile on LinkedIn. Reach out to him if you want to partake in any of the things that he's been talking about. Reach out. 
also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations and your communities that you believe in and around the world. You can support simulation. Our links are below to our show. PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency, you can design cool merch and get paid. Keep supporting us so you can do things like coming on site to Vancouver to interview people like Ben. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. That's so cool, dude. This podcast is so fun. That's really cool work you're doing.